I'm delighted and terribly sad to be here. Um, I arrived in Athena's lab in uh, 2000 as part of a, an Irish wave, a Celtic wave, if you will. Think of it almost like a Conor McGregor fight in Las Vegas. So um, there was myself, John Cryan, there were other Celts in the lab already. Um, and Athena was just incredibly welcoming to us. And uh, one of the reasons I joined Athena's lab, why I was so keen to join Athena's lab, um, was because of this uh, really seminal paper now um, that arrived almost like a, a bolt out of the blue, published in Nature around uh, 1998, right when I was an early graduate student in Sandra Fahl's lab. And the paper, um, you've heard a little bit about this from, from George, um, shows that withdrawal from nicotine, um, shown here spontaneous withdrawal or precipitated withdrawal, uh, is associated with these elevated ICSS thresholds. And one way I interpret that is that the animal just feels miserable. It's in a state of anti-reward, if you will, an anhedonic state or a hypohedonic uh, state. And so the reason why this was and remains so impactful is that the stage when this paper was published, and certainly when I was a graduate student, there was still great debate in the field about whether nicotine was an addictive drug. Is it an addictive drug? Is it the addictive component to tobacco smoke? And a lot of the evidence um, that was used to argue against the, this being uh, the case was the fact that you don't see robust withdrawal responses like you typically would from other bona fide addictive drugs. And so this really um, set the field or, uh, toward recognizing the fact that nicotine can profoundly impact those same reward systems that seem to drive the appetitive properties of addictive drugs, the, the desire to forge and consume those drugs, and you get adaptive responses in those very same circuits. And so this was really uh, a huge binding in the field. And as I was struggling trying to understand aversive properties of nicotine withdrawal using anxiety measures, this seemed like such a clean, robust, really remarkably uh, uh, clean effect that you could see with nicotine withdrawal. And of course, it remains the case. It's very easy to reproduce this effect. So this suggests that as you use nicotine containing tobacco smoke, you get some remodeling of brain award systems. And um, Athena went on, and this is, of course, work from people here in the audience to show that this isn't just a phenomenon that you see in rats, that this extends to humans. And so in humans, not to go into any of the details here, but a really beautiful paper published a couple of years ago in JAMA Psychiatry showing that in smokers experiencing withdrawal, you can see a, a deficit in brain ward activity. And in a great example of this kind of cross-translational approach where instead of being isolated and looking at rodents and you don't know if that translates to humans or human research to know exactly how that aligns with what we consider to be r robust rodent models, uh, Athena and colleagues here set up procedures that look like they, they model the same types of behaviors in both humans and rodents and found that using these procedures you can see this reward deficit phenomenon appear in human smokers and in, in rats. So really elegant work. So this kind of framed Athena's conceptual framework. Again, you've heard a little bit about this in, t in terms of perhaps these crashes, these hypohedonic states, these anhedonic states that you see in animals undergoing withdrawal from not just nicotine, but all other major classes of drugs of abuse may mimic to some degree or may be related at a more fundamental level to the types of uh, reward dysfunction you see in, in people who suffer from depression. And so, again, that helps frame our thinking in the sense that if we can understand using pretty robust animal models, they're really straightforward to set up in terms of drug withdrawal, and understand what drives the reward deficits you see in such models, perhaps that information will be useful for understanding the negative, negative reward states, the anhedonia that you see in those with depression. And so uh, Tina, again, had really seminal contributions in this regard. So Amanda Harrison, who, was, uh, who came from uh, Barry Everett, Trevor Robbins' group, Cambridge group, um, had shown very early on that these deficits you see in brain award function, these uh, marked reward deficits, could be attenuated by uh, a combination, uh, a drug combination that has uh, really clear uh, clinical antidepressant effects in humans. So that suggests that there may be some commonality uh, in terms of what you see in these withdrawal models and what occurs in uh, human depressed patients. Now, these combinations are perhaps not so great when you look in the clinical literature in terms of being effective at treating tobacco dependence. There is some efficacy perhaps in people who are um, 
most prone to depression may, be, may benefit from these kind of combinations. But I think from a conceptual perspective, it suggests that understanding how drug withdrawal arises may provide a framework to identify perhaps um, novel antidepressant drugs that could work on these same reward systems. And this is kind of where m my small contribution to Athena's lab, I, I guess, started. And uh, one of the first papers I had with Athena was a follow-up on um, her work that I showed you in Nature, in which animals experiencing withdrawal had these marked deficits in brain reward activity. Athena was very interested in the role of glutamatergic transmission, both metabotropic and ionotropic glutamate receptors, and asked me to take a look at this. And so, as I say, in one of the first papers I had with Athena, we found that if we uh, activated uh, group two metabotropic glutamate receptors, we could evoke this anhedonic or hypohedonic-like response in nicotine-dependent animals, as showing here. And then conversely, if we blocked the same class of receptor, we could attenuate this response. So you can see a really nice increase in this state of negative reward that's markedly reduced. The, the, the timing for which the animal experiences the state is markedly reduced when you block this class of receptor. And then Athena was pretty excited about this because it suggested that if her idea that the negative state of reward that you see in animals experiencing withdrawal truly does translate into um, depression and targets that modify this behavior could potentially modify symptoms of depression, maybe this would be meaningful in a human perspective. And so this is my first experience with patent law. Um, no, next to nothing about it, but it was uh, Athena who really suggested that maybe we could take all this kind of knowledge that was emerging in the lab in terms of basic mechanisms, particularly glutamatergic mechanisms that uh, contribute to these reward deficits in withdrawing animals and develop novel therapeutics. She wanted to have an impact on human health. And so as part of this patent, this is the European version of uh, the European file patent. Um, you know, the, what she initially states in the patent is that we think that these types of approaches will be useful for drug addiction but it's clearly stated throughout that we think that this could extend into depression, and this is back in the early 2000s. And long before we knew that ketamine, for example, and other glutamatergic modulators have very clear antidepressant-like effects. And so it's very gratifying then for me personally to see Atina's work become impactful close to a decade later in the context of depression. So this is a very recent paper looking at a drug very similar to that that we use in the lab to reverse the reward deficits in animals experiencing nicotine withdrawal, showing that in preclinical models, it looks like it has antidepressant effects that are comparable with those you see with ketamine, which is really fantastic. And I know of a couple of companies now who are pursuing exactly this mechanism to identify novel antidepressant drugs in humans, in large part being driven by the types of work that Atina had published. And then just a I'll go back to so point out there's a couple of other talks today which I encourage you, of course, to pay special attention to because Athena has really played a key role in this transition from preclinical models and then to the identification of hopefully what will be novel therapeutic agents that will show efficacy in humans, both, for, both from an addiction perspective and from a depression perspective, uh, exactly as she predicted, again, close to a decade ago. So again, my own uh, follies in this uh, area persist. Um, this is some uh, work that um, basically uh, emerged directly from the end of my postdoc time in Athena's lab and um, where we we're interested in the basic mechanisms of nicotine reinforcement, nicotine withdrawal. And I had a, a new postdoc in my lab, Christy Fowler, who I believe is here today, uh, a scientific grandchild, if you will, of Athena. And she spent a long time really doggedly trying to establish self-administration procedures for mice so we could begin to look at the behavioral genetics of this. And uh, Christy was really uh, key to showing that a uh, part of the brain that long since been ignored, the medial Habenius IPN pathway, plays a, an absolutely essential role in regulating nicotine reinforcement and does so in a very interesting way. It doesn't necessarily regulate the rewarding effects, the appetitive effects of the drug, but seems to play a key role in the satiety-provoking effects of the drug and then into the aversive properties of the drug. So almost this yin-yang type um, understanding of how drug use is, uh, is regulated. And so why do I show you that? Well, we've now gone back and begun to look at these same questions I was working on as a new postdoc in a team's lab in terms of 
what role does glutamate play in nicotine withdrawal and can we use some of these neuro animal models to investigate that? So we've begun to look, for example, just a small piece of data, the effects of doses of nicotine that we know really don't engage this interesting circuit in the brain and higher doses of nicotine that robustly activate the circuit, yet the animal still continues to self-administer the drug, albeit at lower levels. And when you let the animal ex uh, uh, experience spontaneous withdrawal, um, you basically remove the drug so it can no longer have the drug and it's responding either for, either for saline or you let it have much lower concentrations of nicotine. What we're seeing now is just this robust increase in drug-seeking behavior and animals that have experienced um, the higher nicotine dose that we know activates this pathway. So our interpretation is perhaps this robust um, drug seeking that may contribute, we think may contribute, to the uh, extreme vulnerability of smokers to relapse very early in the withdrawal stage, um, may be related to some degree at least to synaptic alterations that occur within this pathway. And so we've continued to look at that, and in fact, some new data from the lab, we see really dramatic remodeling in terms of glutamatergic transmission in this circuit um, from a portion of the septum. And so animals that experience a sufficient dose of nicotine to engage the circuit, you see marked deficits in glutamatergic transmission. So that was one of the questions with Athena we always asked is, if glutamatergic modulators will influence the reward deficiency in animals, where exactly does this occur in the brain? If we can understand where in the brain it occurs, are there other potential targets there that we could pursue if metabotropics, for example, don't work out? Are there other interesting, perhaps even novel, um, transmitter systems, molecular cascades that are involved in that process? And sure enough, it looks like in terms of the glutamate process, it, we think at least it involves this uh, pathway that we played a part in identifying in my lab, but that work came directly or was related directly from uh, what I was doing in Athena's lab. And then, this last piece of data, if you inactivate the circuit, you can exacerbate this withdrawal response. If you stimulate the circuit, you can attenuate it. So we think we have a substrate that explains where these glutamatergic modulators are actually acting in the brain. And that really was it in terms of science from my perspective. I just wanted to um, finish with a thought, something that stays with me regarding Athena. And that's when I moved and started my own lab um, Close to about 10 years ago now. It's a, a terrifying experience, those of you who have gone through it recently. It's so much that comes at you in such a short period of time. You have to wear many hats. You have to buy equipment, program the equipment, figure, up, figure out IACUC protocols, recruit people, manage people, write grants, get grants. All these things that you have to become proficient at, at really in short order if you're to survive. And during those first three years, I don't think a day went by where I didn't sit down try and take a deep breath. And I always asked myself, what would Athena do? And it was that mantra that always came up. And I remember telling her about it, and she just giggled. She was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, of course you would think like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, I still go back to it. So I've recently moved to New York, and you take on more and more responsibilities, and sometimes they can feel overwhelming. And Athena was always the model for me. And I'd say there isn't a week now that goes by rather than a day when I don't think, what would Athena do? Thank you.